I love this story that Penny just read to us of Jesus' appearance by the sea in Galilee, not Jerusalem, but in Galilee. After the horrendous events in Jerusalem, from Jesus' crucifixion to them having to hide behind locked doors for fears of imprisonment or perhaps worse, and then the astonishing appearances of the res resurrected Christ, here we have a scene sort of from normal life. Peter invited six other disciples to go spend the night fishing. Uh, if you've ever been on the Mediterranean, you'll notice there are lights out on the water at night because that's the fishing boats doing their fishing at night. But what's sort of strange to me is they're only about 100 yards from shore, and this guy on the shore says, hey, you caught nothing, throw your snets on the other side of the boat. How did he get any of those guys to do that? <laughs> Instead of just writing him off as some wacko, you know. But they did it, and they did it, and then they did, and, it, and their nets filled with, with large fish. And then recognition dawned. It's the Lord. So Peter throws on his outer garment, and he swims to shore. And he comes out of the water just dripping wet, of course. And can't you just imagine going up and giving Jesus a bear hug? <laughs> I'm all squeezing and breaking his ribs. I can, I can imagine that. But at the same time, can you imagine just a bit of tinge of pain in the back of Peter's mind over the memory of his denial? That joy and the pain at the same time. After breakfast, Jesus takes Peter aside for a one-on-one -on -one chat. And this conversation gives us deep insight into the process of forgiveness the process of forgiveness. We learn that in addition to the release from guilt, which is what most of us are seeking when we ask for forgiveness from a person or from God, we want to be released from the guilt of that offense. But we learn that God's forgiveness also involves restoration of the person. Because when someone creates the offense, that actually shows something is wrong in the person and can be damaging to both persons. We also learn that forgiveness, in addition to restoration of the person, involves reconciliation of the relationship. Because when we have sinned and we've offended someone, God or someone else, that harms the relationship and drives them further apart. It doesn't bring them closer together. And then when you're dealing with God, forgiveness also brings a renewed call to commitment and to service. That's the process. Forgiveness. It's not just going and having a little confessional and, hey, do this and you're forgiven. There's so much more to it. The release from guilt, the restoration of people, it's reconciliation of relationships. But then it brings us to a renewed call to commitment and to service. One other thing I love about this story is that Jesus doesn't really speak his forgiveness. It's sort of assumed he prepares breakfast for them. Boy, I can bet that was a wonderful breakfast. Those fish were as fresh as you could possibly get. Um, I bet they didn't have any Tabasco sauce to go on them, but anyway. <laughs> uh, I would like a little Cholula myself. But uh, Jesus demonstrates his forgiveness, and I think Peter probably already felt a release from the guilt of what he had done. But in this conversation, then Jesus sits down to have a face-to-face -face conversation, and this brings about something that is so necessary in the process of forgiveness, and that's confession. Confession. Peter needed to confront the one he had denied. Isn't that right? When we have sinned against someone or against God, we need to confess. Of course, when we're confessing to God, we're not telling God something he doesn't know. <laughs> I've got this deep, dark secret, God, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna actually pull it out here and let you know what you don't know. Now, that's not what a confession is when it comes to God, is it? God asks us to confess for our benefit because we have to own up to the truth and be honest with ourselves and with God and with someone else. You can't be healed if you can't be truthful and honest with yourself and with someone else. That's what confession is about. It's not about letting someone know a secret. 
It's about admitting the truth and the reality of what you know. So Jesus sits down with Peter and gives him a chance to face him one-on-one. -on -one. And one thing I love that Jesus does when he asks him this question three times in a row, it's obvious, so obviously deliberate, that Jesus gives him a chance to affirm, yes, you know that I love you, three times in the face of the three times that Peter denied him. You can almost feel the healing grow with each confession, don't you think? Don't you think there's something that's strengthened inside of Peter each time that he said, you know that I love you? And in the three times he knew, what Jesus is doing here is he's restoring Peter's dignity. He's reporting, restoring something in him, inside of him, his self-confidence, his assurance, and his assurance of acceptance that Jesus accepts him. That's all part of the, the forgiveness process, that restoring of the person and the bringing them closer to wholeness. And of course, the restoration of a person and the reconciliation of a relationship go hand in hand, don't they? Because when you hurt someone, they pull apart. Healing requires the healing of the, of the wound and then the bringing together of the two estranged parties. And what I love is that Jesus' focus isn't on the past offense. The whole process of forgiveness is aimed at what's on the other side of forgiveness. What's on the other side of this process of forgiveness? It's they get to share life together again. Jesus and Peter get to share life together again. That's what the reconciliation process is all about. When we go through a forgiveness process, we can share life together with honesty with one another together. That is so beautiful and it's so powerful. Forgiveness is so much more than the release from guilt or saying, oh, I did it. It wants to heal the persons involved and bring them back together so they can share life and live life together once more. Genuine forgiveness leads to restoration and reconciliation, and it restores our alignment with God's life as God's children. Last week, we talked about the mission of the kingdom is living God-centered lives. Well, as we live God-centered lives, we will need to return to the forgiveness process time and time. Again, it's not a one-shot deal, right? Uh, but it's so wonderful that Peter had this really powerful experience of it with Jesus, and I'm sure this came to serve him later when he needed forgiveness and other opportunities in his life. So as we live God-centered lives, we need to return to the forgiveness process to stay centered and connected in the life of God and with the life of God's community. It's a whole part of the transformation process to make us more like Jesus Christ. Well, the question that Jesus asked those three times in a row is really the ultimate question to all disciples, not just to Peter all disciples. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me more than these? Now, when Jesus said, do you love me more than these, he's not saying, Peter, do you love me more than these six other guys on your fishing trip? <laughs> this is not a competition to see who loves Jesus the most. That's not what Jesus is getting at. He's saying, first obvious thing is, do you love me more than you love these six guys? Is your love and commitment to me greater than that? Or maybe he's referring to the whole fishing enterprise that was his livelihood, Peter's livelihood before Jesus came and turned his life upside down. Do you love me more than these other things? When Jesus asked Peter, and when Jesus asked you and asked me, do you love me more than these? This is not the question of an egotistic, an ego-driven question. This is not a narcissist asking for everybody to think they're wonderful. That's not what Jesus is doing here. <laughs> this is a call to discipleship. And remember, Jesus' question happens just a week or so after he has died on the cross. 
the, love, the demonstration of his love for Peter and for the other guys is there. So when Jesus says, do you love me more than all else? He's already demonstrated his love for Peter. When Jesus said, if anyone would come, follow me, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, that is, deny yourself to the point of being willing to die for that, and follow me. Jesus has proved his love for us already. So that question, do you love me more than these, comes in the backdrop of the demonstration of God's love for us. It took Jesus to the ultimate price. Our response of love is to Jesus' sacrificial love. So the question Jesus asked is directed at the recentering of the heart, the clarifying of our commitment and our priorities. Do you love me more than these? What are the these for you? What's the more than these? What would the more than these for you? What is it that competes for that total commitment to Jesus Christ? What is it that competes with following Jesus in love and his example in life? More than these. I'm not going to try to give an illustration of high possibilities because Ed, each one of us has our own these. <laughs> They're different for different people. But we need to face that question before Jesus. Do you love me more than, hmm, what am I putting as a priority or more important than my connection to Jesus Christ? Living that God-centered life. Well, Peter asked, Jesus asked Peter that question three times. And then Peter, to his credit, each time affirms his love for you. Oh, Lord, you know I love you. But then what does Jesus ask for him after his affirmation of love? Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. What the response that Jesus Christ asks of us in a class where we confess our love for him is to live that love through service and mission. Love is not something you take and you hide in a jar somewhere. It's not something you take and put in a bank vault or a safety deposit box. Once you've received love, you have to give. That's the very nature of love. Reach out and give and serve. So Jesus tells Peter, okay, you love me? Then here's something I want you to do. Tend my sheep. Now, Peter's calling, what Jesus is asking Peter to do isn't the same thing Jesus would ask you to do. We all have different things to do. <laughs> if Jesus was having this conversation with you, he wouldn't say, tend my sheep. He would say, fill in the blank. Right? But here's, here's something so important to get back across. God, Jesus doesn't call Jesus, Peter to a greater degree of commitment than he calls you or than he calls me. God calls us to the same degree of commitment that Jesus called Peter to. It's just that we have different tasks. If you love me, fill in the blank. That's something you need to hear from the Lord himself. A God-centered life is grounded in love, driven by love, but it's expressed and lived through service and mission. It is so fortunate today as we're dealing with this story and this passage that we're going to celebrate communion because Holy Communion gives us the perfect opportunity to experience what Peter experienced. We can come here and be forgiven of the guilt of our sins. You need that? I need that. We can come and be forgiven of our sins. But not just that, we can be restored in our sense of identity as God's children. We can be reconciled with God and with one another and have our relationships healed as we come to the Lord's table. And then as we come to the table, we renew our profession of faith and commitment to Christ. Do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And out of our experience of God's love and grace that we receive in this holy sacrament, we leave here 
to serve God's kingdom. We demonstrate and tell the good news of God's love in Jesus Christ. So at this table today, we receive God's love, and we commit ourselves to love in Christ's name.